Welcome to this special edition of the Ravencast. I'm Suzanne Ross and I'm here in Denver at the Conference of the Colloquium on Violence and Religion with our dear friend, James Allison. Hi, hi James. Hi Suzanne and hi y'all Raven Foundation. Yes, thank you for uh, talking with us today. Uh, if you don't know James, he is a Catholic theologian, priest and author, most recently of a uh, course of uh, introduction to the Christian faith called Jesus the Forgiving Victim, Listening for the Unheard Voice that we produced together, Indeed. Raven and James in partnership. So that was just wonderful. Um, so we are, James, you are well known as a, um, as using mimetic theory in Rene Girard in your theology mm -hmm. and yeah. your many books uh, that you know, have been inspirational and influential in my life and in the lives of many people I know who are watching this. Um, but we are here in Denver uh, to discuss uh, something uh, that's in the news all the time, which is this sort of plague of alternative facts. And uh, the name of the conference this year is called After Truth. Right. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to talk with you for a few minutes about any thoughts you have about the current political climate in the U.S. You are uh, currently living in Madrid, uh, a, still a British citizen. You, British you, citizen, that's what we call it now. It was a British what, subject when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Although we've got the same queen, it's now called a British citizen. There you go, there you go. So you have, you know, I like that, you know, cross-Atlantic perspective on what's happening here in the U.S. So. Right. Um, any thoughts on where where we're going in in this uh, post truth era? A bit, yes. Um, I think that the uh, the post truth element is much more reactive than we think. Mm. We tend to think of post truth. Um, people as being people who are standing up and doing something and the rest of us kind of lost liberals reacting to it with horror and whatever. I, really, I don't think it's like that. I think that one of the really difficult things for all of us in the modern world is how, uh, how identity is being lost all across the board. Mm -hmm. All the things that seemed to be sure signs of belonging, sure ways of being, all of them seem to be coming ever so much more fragile and so who I am or whatever, whatever that is, it's, it's much more up for grabs. Uh, mm. and it seems that it's ever more diaphanous, ever, ever less clear. And I think that one of the reactions to that is people saying, hold on, this is running away with me. I want to stop it. Mm. Uh, I want there to be something that I can hold on to, something that is that I belong to, something that is me. Um, part of the trouble is that we know too much <laughs> uh, to be able to believe our own stories about what we're grasping onto. Mm. So there's a different, what we talk about fake news uh, and so on, in many senses it's people half knowing or more than half knowing that they're telling a lie about what it is that they're holding onto. But whatever it is, it's better than nothing. And I think it's the sense of, I, I, I'm not going to be anything at the end of this, that is perhaps the driving uh, factor. And this is something which seems to me to be part of the outworking of what uh, uh, René describes with uh, the way in which our strictures against desire are breaking down in the post-sacrificial <laughs> world which means that they're constantly being lived in small uh, ways, which we can detect mm. and then use as part of our usual war against <laughs> uh, other people. But we can't hide the fact that we actually know, at least in part, what we're doing. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. And I think that, that for me, at least, the task uh, is trying to find a way of living within that and making sense of it without being run by it. Yeah. Uh, or above all, without being panicked by it. Uh, because panic is not a good uh, counselor. Um, so it, when those of us who uh, get, become scandalized when we hear 
Trump rhetoric, calling things he disagrees with fake news. Um, is that also a grasping after identity, our reaction uh, to him? I think that it's very easy for it to become, it, it would be very easy for it to become that, which is why I think it's probably, I mean, you know, the man is a giant distraction, frankly, um, because uh, he is, uh, I mean, he is what he is. He's been, he's been what he is ever since the, he stepped, came down the escalator, mm -hmm. announced the Olympics campaign. In, in one sense, there has been nothing hidden there. There's a strange garrulousness uh, about him. It, it's, it's the reaction of everybody else <laughs> that, is the, <laughs> that is the amazing thing. Um, and the degree to which the whole phenomenon has uh, opened up to us much more about ourselves, perhaps, than we're comfortable <laughs> Exactly, because yeah. he does seem to understand that behind, uh, you know, the support he has is this need to find a sense, a stable sense of self. So he holds up a lot of others for for, for easy to, ridicule and so on. Easy so forth. ridicule to be against. But, and he changes his mind with an understanding. Uh, so, so, I mean, you know, it, it's not at all clear that there is a there there, and one shouldn't worry about it too much. It seems to me uh -huh. that the really interesting question is um, how are we coping with the yeah. world that this is revealing as being our world? Yes. Um, we've, uh, you know, he has created merry havoc with his own political party just as Brexit has created merry havoc uh, with the Conservative Party in, in, in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the fact that all the rest of us are dealing with the consequences in, in, in a whole variety of different ways, but this is part of the dynamic of the world in which we're going to have to learn to be, if you like, less uh, less convinced of the centrality of our own identities and more aware of how much uh, we are given to be who we are, um, to be able to hold more lightly to the many different things uh, uh, that form us. Mm -hmm. And all those ways which, as Daniel says, that we're actually much more like each other than, which we're, than we are yeah. unlike each other. It's interesting that those people who are all against internationalism, mm -hmm. it's nonsense. It's merely a different bunch of nations that they're happy to be <laughs> international with. Um, but so that makes them very like us and us very like them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so that, that's part of what I'm trying to work out. And of course, for me, the key question in the midst of all this is, you know, it's, what on earth does it mean to be, to be Catholic, to be Christian in the middle of this? What, 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 is, what is church, given that it's supposed to be a sign of the reconciliation of all humanity coming together? Uh, and in one sense, there are good signs in the midst of this. We are actually all much more like each other. Um, crazy though it may seem. I mean, you know, the, uh, even with the high tensions between Russia and uh, the United States, actually Russian soccer fans, Croatian soccer fans, English soccer fans, etc., etc., have been remarkably like each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and guess what? They wear many of the same clothes with the same brands and they shout at each other in similarly uh, testosterone fueled ways. And uh, in other words, uh, <laughs> there is a certain. Uh, healthy communality about all that as well as uh, as well as the, the more worrying things so uh, difficult to tell where where the posturing starts and where real hatred uh, mm. begins um, and how dangerous these things uh, how dangerous these things are and also how uh, the difficulty of those who think they're just posturing uh, when, if ever, do they realize that actually their posturing has consequences uh, mm -hmm. uh, that they may not have intended, but that are entirely predictable, um, mm -hmm. that things lead in hateful directions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, you know, I think that that's, I imagine, for instance, that those involved in the current immigration uh, tighten, tightening up were probably as shocked as anybody else uh, at what a complete mess this creates in terms of displacement of people. Mm -hmm. Because it's fine to have ideas about something, but when you actually start trying to cash them out and, right. and practice and realize that this leads to uh, a certain kind of legalism run amok, so that you have what, mm -hmm. infants being taken before judges without representation, um, yes. uh, you think, well, what can this, this has run away? What, is, what can <laughs> stop this?
what can stop this? Exactly. Something, well, something has run away here. Something has escaped. Right. Whatever strange mixture of good intentions and bad intentions were behind this, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. something has run away. Um, and of course, that's when we have to be really careful. How do we stop things running away? Yeah. Exactly. And not become, not, not jumping on the runaway train, you know, or making it go faster. Not making it go faster. I think that's one of the ideas that you've helped me understand very much is that when you, when you want to, uh, when you oppose something and want to change it by breaking it down or destroying it, you're feeding the conflict. Uh, and you have this wonderful sense of, I phrase, of transforming something from within. From within yeah. And I wonder if you could say just something about that as a strategy to keep our sanity well, <laughs> right yeah, no, now. I, I wish I had strategies to keep, uh, to keep sanity, but I really don't. I'm not even in my own uh, <laughs> little world. But I mean, I think that it means that with each one of these uh, new realities, they're there, they're there for a reason. I mean, uh, mass immigration is occurring for a variety of reasons, for a variety of climatic, uh, economic, military uh, reasons. Trying to pretend that it isn't and that it's not going to be going on is not a sensible thing to do for anybody in the long term. It's economically catast catastrophic for those countries that might have received them, as well as, of course, for the people themselves who are in these very dangerous in-between in -between places. Mm -hmm. But so thinking more positive, what does it mean to be a humanity at any time, a third of which is in some sense part of a migrant uh, a population, mm -hmm. which has been the history of all of us. I mean, humans are mm -hmm. uh, unstoppable wanderers uh, and always have been. Um, so, so how we're going to take on board what that's going to mean and how to create reasonable ways to stop communities being broken apart and destroyed by this, because there are some people who say, actually, we can't cope with people coming here. Yeah. There are others who convince themselves that they can't, but can very well. Uh, but so discerning uh, right. for that, that's going to be, I mean, that's what the European authorities have been very bad at doing mm -hmm. up until now, and I hope are beginning to, uh, to learn uh, to do. And um, if the only purpose of uh, the Trump sessions changes was to try and stir things up, well, they've certainly done that. The question is, after the stir up, what do you want to be left with? Um, uh, and that's, you know, what was it, Lenin's, uh, you, you've got to break eggs in order to make an omelette. You can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. Okay, well, you have all the egg breaking. Now, what's the shape of the omelette going to, exactly. uh, going to be? So I'm. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate that because you're you're asking us to ask the questions that matter and focus our energies on uh, things that will build up community rather than being just angry all the time. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, but I, I assume we all assume. I mean, anger is contagious. Uh, I've noticed my language has got worse since uh, mm -hmm. since Trump came on the scene. I share all the same wavelengths as everybody else. Uh, it's easy to become, you know, uh, witty and edgy and irritable and smart and sassy in answers to things. Um, um, and I guess that, you know, Twitter, having become the means of communication in one sense, is, is, uh, is helpful for that. So, yeah, learning how to think slow, um, for me, that's, that's the thing. And it's difficult because thinking slow is, and this is a point I try to make about theology, theology has got to be slow thought mm -hmm. if it's real. Mm -hmm. And slow thought is not worth anything. That's the, that's the point. It's not immediately marketable. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but if, if we don't have slow thought, mm -hmm. it's always going to be reactive. Uh, yeah. So we've got to take the time to to sink into the spaces where we can ourselves mm. find ourselves less reactive, which I'm completely hypocrite in saying it because I find it very difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, well, we always preach the sermon we need <laughs> to hear, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, James, because we all needed to hear that. Oh. Um, and uh, we appreciate you being with us and um, look forward to the Is next that all? chat. Oh, I thought we were just, I thought that was the preface. But well, <laughs> well that, that's all for this moment. All for this moment. Yes, okay. so thank you very much. Okay, thank you.